Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Emmett Pierce. This is Ukraine War Update Extra video, giving you extra nuggets and tidbits to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. And actually I want to talk about one subject and one subject only. And this is kind of a purge for me. I need to get this out of my system uh, and possibly use this as a reference video going forward. I'm going to talk about Donald Trump, the former US president, and I'm going to talk about Ukraine and how he feels about the Ukraine war and whether he's going to be good for Ukraine or bad for Ukraine if he gets the presidency in November 2024 in the US elections. I know my position might mean that I'm going to be approaching this with an awful, awful lot of bias and baggage, and that is no doubt to some degree true. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit, therefore, about cognitive dissonance reduction. I know I've said this a million times to you guys before, but it's worth going through again now. So I'm going to be coming at this, you know, in my anti-Trump uh, way and uh, you know, I'll be bringing a, a bias and a baggage to this, as I, I've said. And I need to make sure that I overcome that by presenting some receipts, by presenting uh, enough evidence to say that, you know, show that this isn't just me going on some tirade against someone I don't particularly politically like. And in the same way, I get criticised by people who are a big fan of Mr. Trump um, or former President Trump. And I think we both will be suffering from, you know, uh, the the uh, bit, we, we'll both be victim of bias, right? I, I would speculate that there will be some Republicans who would watch this video and either like Donald Trump fully and have the issue of being confronted with evidence against uh, that core belief, and that will present pr um, present in their mind something called cognitive dissonance, which is where you have a core belief, and there's some evidence against that belief. So the core belief is that Trump is awesome, Trump is amazing, uh, everything about him is brilliant. And then you get some evidence against that that you have to deal with, because either, either your core belief is wrong, or... There's, there's something wrong with the evidence that's being presented to you. But those two kind of ideas can't consistently exist in your mind. They can't coherently, cohesively exist in your mind. And so something has to go. And it's rarely your core belief. And so you will do something with the evidence against that belief. You will bury it, attack the person that's telling you it, um, compartmentalize, ignore, poison the well, all sorts of fallacies or heuristics, methods, mechanisms your brain will employ in order to minimize the, the uh, evidence, rational evidence against your core belief. And some of you will be not big fans of Trump, but Republicans. And you'll get another type of cognitive dissonance where you will feel intuitively, even though you know that Trump is not is not cool in in some degrees, in some areas, to, to some degree in some areas. But because he's Republican, he kind of represents Republicanism. And even though you're not wholly on board with him, any attack on Donald Trump is by extension a sort of attack on republicanism and so even you will end up defending Donald Trump and sometimes irrationally so because you feel a personal affront because all of this gets mixed up with your sense of identity so our political beliefs become part of our identity our idolizing of any individual becomes part of our identity so it's almost as if republicanism or or Donald Trump is part of who you are or I am or whatever you know you can I can talk about my favorite band my favorite musicians and I love them so much they're part of who I am and so if someone insults that uh that band or that that front man in in the band of my in my favorite band then I take that as a personal front I remember when I was at school insulting the voice of Michael Stipe in R.E.M. Not in any way. I said, oh, I don't like that song. I don't like his, the, the, the pitch of his voice there. My mate was a massive R.E.M. fan and just had a like, rant at me and my favourite bands. And I was like, 
And that's when I first started understanding that people associate with ideas very personally and then then get really emotive. It's like, oh, this is really interesting. I started doing some psychoanalysis on my mate. We were only like 15 or whatever. Uh, but but that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. So we react very personally and emotionally to criticisms of things connected to us because they are they are part and parcel of who we are or who we see ourselves to be and so therefore because we believe we are perfect and there's nothing wrong with our beliefs otherwise we wouldn't have those beliefs um it must be you that's wrong or the evidence that's wrong because i cannot be wrong if i admit that i'm wrong then all sorts of things or less than perfect then all sorts of things start crumbling and so we build up the this edifice of who we are and we put these walls around to inoculate ourselves from criticism uh, and it's much more difficult to say, oh, actually, that person is nuanced or I'm nuanced. And, mm, I, I'm, I could be a little bit weak there, I'm, but I, mm, I believe that about this person. But this over here about that person is not cool. You know, we see this with people like Elon Musk, who has like really, really um, almost like cultish. And I would say the same for Donald Trump defenders that, that cannot see wrong with with him rather than saying, well, actually, you know, he, he's done a good job over there, but I'm I'm really dubious about what he's claiming about Ukraine, so on and so forth. So cognitive dissonance reduction is our is our propensity to want to reduce the dissonance, that disharmony in our minds between core beliefs and evidence against that belief. So when you are listening to this video, when you're watching this video, just think where do you sit on that spectrum of what you think about Trump, whether this is going to be a lot of confirming your already held biases and how could this be wrong? How could things I'm saying be wrong? Always question that as, as I should be doing to myself. But if you're if you're sitting in on the other side of the fence where you are either a big fan of Donald Trump or you are a Republican who is a bit dubious of Donald Trump, but you but just be warned that there will be this intuitive defense of Donald Trump for being an extension or some representation, some iteration of the Republican Party and your Republicanism. And therefore, it's a slight dent on you and your beliefs. OK, so there will be all sorts of psychology going on. I just really wanted to get that out of the way first. I, I think it's important. Uh, there are so many ways of going into this, but I want to start with uh, a a part of the comment that was sent to me the other day, and I think this would be good stimulus. So, the, and this is from someone who's actually a really good supporter of the channel, uh, ha, has been here for a long time, but we, we are on different ends of the political spectrum to some degree, and we both know that. And, and so I want to, first of all, thank him for being such a strong supporter, although I massively disagree with things that he said um, concerning Trump recently. So there is literally zero credible evidence, he says, that Trump is orchestrating some sort of anti-Ukraine conspiracy with the Speaker or other House members. That's the main thing I want to look at today. And and although you, you, you might say, oh, stop worrying about individual comments or whatever, actually, they're just a really good vehicle into talking about these ideas. And I freaking love doing it. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> right. Now, I'd pick out some words here. Orchestrating, I think this is Trump just saying, don't do that. If you want to call that orchestrating, fair enough. And conspiracy, um, I don't know if that's a loaded word. I think this is just like Trump has his reasons for wanting to side with Putin. I think some of them are psychological. I think some of them are practical. Some of them might even involve finances and his own business interests. But there, there are reasons he wants to support Putin or Russia over Ukraine and then reasons he doesn't like Ukraine. That has, has given him a particular position position concerning this war and he's trying very hard or succeeding actually in getting people to adhere to his position and those people are have key positions and that's what I'm saying. So you know, there, there, there might be a bit of a straw manning of my position there or just using words that I wouldn't necessarily use. So conspiracy with the Speaker or other House members. I just think he is definitely influencing other House members. And I think it's fairly easy to see that. In fact, he says, all reports show Trump is warm on Zelensky's offer to visit Ukraine and said the meeting with Cameron went well. Uh, just to let you know that he's actually not going to meet with 
uh, Zelensky in Ukraine. And he's used some interesting reasoning for that, which is uh, basically completely... Well, it's, it's huge double standards that make any sense. So his reasoning is that it's not appropriate for someone who's not in his position. You know, uh, you know so uh, he's he's not a, a an elected politician at the moment. Uh, so he, he, it's the wrong time, and it's not right for him to go and visit um, Zelensky. Uh, the issue there is he's just had Viktor Orban and laid out the carpet for him visiting I, him in Mar-a-Lago, and that's you know. Okay, so so you'll let someone come to you for a meeting, and David Cameron let someone come to you, but you won't go to them. So I think it's nothing to do with, you know, not being appropriate. It's, you don't want to do that anyway. Uh, so just that puts that part to bed. Uh, you should be more careful, he says, not to spread misinformation or Chinese propaganda like you did there, because not only does it ruin your personal credibility, but it puts the professionalism of your work on par with that of Syriac. And that 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 I have to say that did upset me a little bit in terms of like. I don't see myself as spouting Chinese uh, misinf- propaganda or spreading misinformation at all. Not not in that way. I, I feel exceptionally strongly about Trump, uh, and I'm hopefully going to show you why I'm justified in in feeling that way and justified it in saying that he is simply not good for Ukraine. And I think it's actually relatively obvious. And I think there's cognitive dissonance reduction going on that people who don't want to see that. And it's not that I want to see it. Uh, it's that it's just there. It's just the evidence is there. Uh, Johnson not meeting Cameron is a non-issue. Okay, it's not like Cameron is going to tell Johnson something he didn't already know or couldn't pick up the phone to call and relay. Yep, uh, better off Johnson spend as much time as possible focusing on those A packages and Pfizer reform. Okay, won't go down those rabbit holes. But uh, yeah, I don't think. It's this idea that there's zero credible evidence, and I, I, I'm struggling to actually constrain the amount of evidence there is. This this video could be about three hours long. Like, I don't understand how you can say there's literally. So you're really strong. Like, there's literally no evidence that Trump is trying to uh, make other members of his. You know, other people under his influence, sort of Marjorie Taylor Greene, Freedom Caucus, Mike Johnson, whoever it is, zero evidence uh, that that he's being like that. And and I, I think the larger real, con- really, the larger conversation is whether he's for or against uh, Ukraine here. So okay, so much to go through. We- we're going to start uh, before the 2022 iteration of, of the war in Ukraine and actually go back. This is a Politico article written in 2019, but it goes back all the way to sort of 2006, around that time and onwards. Trump calls Ukraine corrupt. He still wanted to build a resort there. And this is a massive Politico article, as mentioned, written in 2019, talking about the connections Trump and his family had to Ukraine and how they tried to build a uh, the Trumps were looking to erect luxury erect luxury resorts across the former Soviet republics and Ukraine seemed like a promising location so tried to build some some stuff there and indeed you know as they did in Moscow with Trump Tower uh, that he tried and failed to get done um but yeah didn't get over the finishing line as one of the chaps Felix Sato who I think ended up I think on the wrong side of the law I remember speaking to the Trump organization about the opportunity in Yalta it didn't get to the finish line uh, developer Felix Sato said in 2008 the Trump organization's efforts in Ukraine faded in fact the company's broader push in the former Soviet Union never resulted in any completed properties Trump pulled out the deal to develop a 47 story luxury tower in the Black Sea resort town of Batumi Georgia and the Trump high rise in Bak- the capital of Azerbaijan remains unfinished. In the late 2000s, Trump sued journalist Timothy O'Brien after he said he lost out on deals in both Kiev and Yalta after the publication of an unflattering book. The lawsuit was dismissed. Uh, Representative Roger Krishnamurthy, uh, Democrat Illinois, who serves on the House Oversight Committee, which is investigating whether Trump is illegally profiting off the presidency, so this is back in 2019, called the attempt to develop the resort in Ukraine hypocritical, given that President's 
rhetoric about the Bidens, obviously the whole Burisma thing. Uh, he said that the situation reminded him of Trump's unsuccessful project in Russia. Trump did not disclose the ongoing Trump Tower Moscow negotiations while he was running for president, repeatedly claiming he had nothing to do with Russia, but his former attorney and fixer Michael Cohen is serving a three-year prison sentence in part for lying to Congress about the timing of those negotiations. So, in fact, he did have things to do with Russia, things to do with Ukraine. You know, Trump Trump was is not coming to the whole Russia Ukraine war as a kind of blank slate. The guy has had um, negotiations with both Ukraine and Russia in terms of furthering his business empire, and some of those haven't worked. And it will be taking some of that um, experience into his ideas of you know who the good guys and bad guys are in in the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, CNN wrote uh, an article back in March 2022, which I think is very, very important to know. And it's four things to remember about Trump, Ukraine and Putin. And I think we kind of forgotten some of the stuff uh, in, in Trump's past with regards to elements about this war. So, Let's go through that. I am going to read this. I think it's that important. Trump took Russia's side when the conflict began. A popular revolution in 2014 ousted the pro-Russian regime in Kiev, which was led by President Viktor Yanukovych, and, and replaced it with a Western-leaning government. Russian troops soon invaded the Ukrainian territory of Crimea, initiating the armed conflict that escalated this year. So 2022. Within weeks, Trump praised Putin. So don't forget, you know, that... that we kind of got an idea about where Trump sat with this present war back in 2014 in the earliest iteration or the earlier iteration of this war. So Trump praised Putin for how he handled the takeover of Crimea and predicted that, quote, the rest of Ukraine will fall fairly quickly. Echoing Kremlin propaganda, Trump said in a TV interview that the Crimean people would rather be with Russia, a position he also pushed in private. One of the 2016 campaign aides falsely claimed that Russia did not seize Crimea. So this is Trump's position, right? Trump Quote, Trump said that Crimea is Russian because people speak Russian. Where have we heard that before? Said Elena Petukova of Malfa, a Kiev-based business intelligence firm, who called it an absolutely pro-Kremlin view. According to this logic, quote, the entire territory of the United States should belong to Great Britain. That's exactly the argument I use whenever I hear this. But this was what this is what we hear from Russian trolls, right? But this was what um, Putin, <laughs> this is what Trump was saying. So when Russian-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine shot down a commercial airline in 2014, so MH17, killing 298 people, Trump sowed doubt about Russia's involvement. All of these claims are hyperlinked. He embraced Putin's denials, even after US and European officials publicly concluded that Russia was complicit. There's been a, a Hague uh, court case about this that has found three people guilty in absentia but that's against what Donald Trump himself advocated then. Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, and that's a whole other, you know, well, I've already ad advised that you guys go and watch Active Measures on Amazon Prime uh, as a fantastically information-dense documentary that, that talks about Paul Manafort's connections to Russia. But he spent a decade advising Yanukovych in Ukraine, collaborated in 2016 with a Russian spy on a secret plan for, for Trump to help Russia control eastern Ukraine, according to special counsel Robert Mueller's report. The proposal envisions that Yanukovych would return to lead a Russian puppet state in eastern Ukraine. This pro-Russian rhetoric didn't always translate into policy for the Trump White House. For instance, his administration said sanctions would continue until Russia returned Crimea. But the rhetoric gave Putin an unexpected cheerleader in D.C., and created tensions within NATO. So there were issues. The writing was on the wall, I think, in 2014. Then we have Trump's mixed record on arming Ukraine. And this is what we often hear from uh, fans of Trump who say, well, you know, what about all the javelins he gave to, uh, to Ukraine? He armed Ukraine. Well, first of all, he didn't. The Department of Defense kind of sorted that out. And second of all, he tried to stop them by bribing 
blackmailing, attempting to blackmail Zelensky. And it's that decision of Zelensky not to go forward with that that I think is partly to to blame, if you like, or is partly the reason why Trump is now so anti-Ukraine. He holds a grudge. So the article continues, President Joe Biden has dramatically increased the flow of arms to Ukraine, including anti-tank missiles, anti-aircraft warfare systems, drones, rifles and other weapons. Importantly, it was Trump who first sent lethal aid in a major reversal from the Obama administration, which refused to send offensive weapons to Ukraine during the early stages of fighting in the eastern Donbass region. But Trump has a checkered pass on this topic. As a candidate, his position was unclear at best. Trump campaign aides intervened during the 2016 Republican National Convention to block language from the GOP party platform that called on the US to send lethal arms to Ukraine. So it's the GOP that wanted to send arms to Ukraine and it was Trump aides that blocked language concerning that. So he didn't want that. It's the GOP that did. How fascinating is that? In 2019, Trump infamously withheld nearly $400 million in military aid as part of his attempt to pressure Zelensky into announcing sham corruption investigations into Biden and his family's business dealings. The weapons in his stalled aid package include the Javelin missiles that have emerged as a crucial part of Ukraine's surprisingly robust defences against Russian tanks. This is obviously 2022. This led to Trump's first impeachment, but he was acquitted by the GOP-run Senate. Uh, some of the Republicans who opposed his impeachment are now urging Biden to send more weapons. Quote, the GOP is the a, is a party of the Russia Hawks. For half a century, uh, one of their central organizing principles was opposing the Soviet threat, Graf said, adding that Trump upended that history and made some Republicans go soft on Putin. Quote, but in the last month, a lot of Republicans who became wishy-washy on Russia have come back to their natural position as Russia Hawks. I would actually argue that they've then subsequently gone back to being soft on Russia. Trump, or some of them have, not all, of course. Uh, Trump led, an, or at least some of them have gone back to not sticking, not wanting to stick their neck out uh, too much about their uh, support for Ukraine. Trump led an anti-Ukraine smear campaign. And this is so important to remember uh, that he blamed Ukraine for interfering with the US elections. So throughout his presidency, Trump pushed a litany of false claims about Ukraine in public and in private. He rarely missed an opportunity to criticise the country. A widely respected dip diplomat testified in Congress that Trump believed, quote, Ukraine was a corrupt country full of terrible people. So that's the baggage Trump was is taking now or was taking into his uh, into his tenure as president. And then beyond that, like, those are his beliefs about Ukraine. Trump's biggest lie was about the 2016 election. He rejected the reality that Russia interfered to help him win. Instead, he falsely claimed it was Ukraine who meddled and that he was a victim. These lies, which were he repeated dozens of times, were a double boon to the Kremlin. They downplayed Russia's brazen attack on US democracy while simultaneously smearing Ukraine. These views quickly became the party line for GOP lawmakers and conservative pundits, even though top Russian experts like Fiona Hill publicly warned that it was all Russian propaganda. This was a break from decades of warm US policy towards Ukraine, especially when dealing with leaders like Zelensky, who tried to reorient this country toward the West. Former President George W. Bush praised the Ukrainian people in 2004 for protecting a rigged election, and Obama celebrated the 2014 revolution that ousted a Kremlin-friendly government in Kyiv. Quote, when Trump muddies the water by praising Putin or undermines Zelensky and spreads falsehoods about Ukraine, this has real implications for how this crisis plays out, said Jordan Gans Morse, a Northwestern University professor who was a Fulbright scholar in Ukraine. Quote, it shapes public opinion in ways that tie Biden's hands when he's a de facto wartime president. And then finally, Trump repeatedly undermined Zelensky. G GQ magazine recently wrote about Zelensky's endless heroism and Time magazine said he united the world. But the mythos of Zelensky as a Churchill-like figure is a new development. Less than three years ago, Zelensky was a fledgling politician that Trump and his cronies took advantage of as part of a ham-handed attempt to smear candidate Biden. The US-Ukraine relationship was put on a back burner and replaced with Trump's personal and political needs. Zelensky's top priorities were to get more shipments of American weapons and 
to meet Trump at the White House. Veteran US de diplomats in Kyiv shared this goal, but they were smeared and sidelined and replaced by a band of Trump loyalists who made his demands clear. Zelensky could only get these things if he announced that Ukraine was investigating Biden for corruption. So I don't know if you remember, but the uh, ambassador at the time to Ukraine was that Trump was absolutely not a fan of and uh, got rid of, if I, I remember correctly. This strong arming by Team Trump forced Zelensky in his first months in office to navigate a surprisingly hostile relationship with the US as supposed top ally in his fight against Russia. Quote, Zelensky had more than enough on his plate when he came to power, Gans Morse said. Quote, the country was already at war with Russia. He's a political novice. And then on top of that, the most powerful person in the world essentially extorted him. And he had to devote time and energy to deal with that. It's unclear that the full, what the full impact was, but it definitely tested Zelensky. And then we get on to what happened, which I think tells you everything you need to know about Zelensky, about, um, sorry, Trump. This, this, and I've said this many times before, I think this is one of Trump's worst um, political moments on the international stage. 4-3 of the Trump administration, and today was indeed another first for the Trump presidency. For that matter, this was a first for the American presidency. Following their meeting in Helsinki, the president wasn't soft on Vladimir Putin, as some had feared. He embraced him. He validated him. He sided with Putin over the home team when given the chance. He went on to attack his own. And I, I think this is absolutely uh, disgusting, I have to say. The chance. He went on to attack his own people and institutions while standing next to the Russian president. We have never seen or heard anything like this from an American president on soil, foreign or domestic. But motivated, perhaps, by a deathly fear that his own election may be seen as illegitimate, he delivered what a veteran U.S. diplomat called the single most embarrassing performance he's ever seen on the world stage. Tonight, a former defense secretary and CIA director called this, perhaps, the most tragic day in the history of the presidency. I just think we forget things too easily. This tells you where Trump is. This is where he was, and I think this is where he is. The president returned from Helsinki tonight, an overseas trip that has left a lot of damage behind. Think of it. He criticized American allies, most especially NATO. He insulted the British prime minister. And just a day prior to this summit with Putin, he called the European Union a foe of the United States. Trump and Putin were alone together for over two hours. What they discussed, what they agreed to, is known only to those two men and their interpreters. Then came the news conference. The president invoked Hillary Clinton's emails. He relitigated his election victory in the Electoral College. And when challenged on Russia's successful hack of our election, he went after the Mueller investigation. I hold uh, both countries responsible. I think that the United States has been foolish. I think we've all been foolish. I think we're all uh, to blame. I think that the, the probe is a disaster for our country. I think it's kept us apart. It's kept us separated. There was no collusion at all. On the upside, we got to hear that Putin wanted Trump to be elected. The most remarkable comments from the president were in response to a question from Jonathan Lemire of the Associated Press, our frequent contributor around here, who is standing by to join us. Here is what he asked the president. President Putin denied having anything to do with the election interference in 2016. Every U.S. intelligence agency has concluded that Russia did. What, who, my first question for you, sir, is who do you believe? My second question is, would you now, with the whole world watching, Tell President Putin, would you denounce what happened in 2016, and would you warn him to never do it again? So let me just say that we have two thoughts. You have groups that are wondering why the FBI never took the server. Why haven't they taken the server? My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me, and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. I have great confidence in my intelligence people, but uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial. Even one of... 
So he sided with President Putin just by sitting with him for two hours. No one else there but the interpreters came out and said, yeah, it turns out all my intelligence services are wrong. And I believe this guy who's a former KGB officer that, I mean, duping other people is, is his pastime, right? I, I just... At the time, I found that absolutely disgusting. Of the president's most steadfast supporters was stunned by what he saw and heard today. Newt Gingrich, former House Speaker, called on Trump to clarify his comments and described them as, quote, the most serious mistake of his presidency. Late this afternoon, the director of national intelligence, you heard his name there, Dan Coats, whose judgment the president went against, sent out this statement. The role of the intelligence community is to provide the best information and fact-based assessments possible for the president and policymakers. We have been clear in our assessments of Russian meddling in the 2016 election and their ongoing pervasive efforts to undermine our democracy, and we will continue to provide unvarnished and objective intelligence in support of our national security. And social media companies have come out and and completely confirmed that sources tell nbc news coat statement was not approved by the traveling white house before its release while trump may have doubts about the intel surrounding the russia investigation and Mueller's latest indictment of the 12 russian agents there was also this offer from putin to help with the prosecution of the this accused. blows my mind this blows my mind we can actually permit Special representatives of the United States, including the members of this very commission um, headed by Mr. Mueller, we can let them into the country and they will be present at this questioning. Putin added that in exchange he would want Russian law enforcement to be allowed similar privileges when it came to cases involving Americans who broke Russian laws. Tonight, the Washington Post has new reporting on the White House view of all of this, quote, Ahead of the meeting, staffers provided Trump with some 100 pages of briefing materials aimed at laying out a tough posture toward Putin, but the president ignored most of it, according to one person familiar with the discussions who requested anonymity to disclose internal deliberations. Trump's remarks were very much counter to the plan, the person said. Everyone around Trump was urging him to take a firm stance with Putin, according to a second person familiar with the preparations. In advance of Monday's meeting, the second person said advisors covered everything from Russia's annexation of Crimea to its meddling in the U.S. elections. But Trump made a game time decision to handle the summit his way. Former CIA. So he basically came out and said that that Putin was was basically spot on. And what a wonderful idea Putin had for for in his suggestion, which is absolutely obscene. And here he is extolling the virtues of Putin's suggestion. And again, remember that rhetoric of, of very strong loves. He loves his strong men. But uh, I will tell you that President Putin was extremely strong and powerful in his denial today. And what he did is an incredible offer. Incredible. He offered to have the people working on the case come and work with their investigators with respect to the 12 people. I think that's an incredible offer. Tonight, the so it basically, it's, I think it's an incredible offer to get Russian investigators involved here. Just what are you? I just it absolutely blows my mind that he was standing there and say, "What an incredible offer! What an incredible offer of of Putin to get his people investigating us." Yeah, that's brilliant. So, like, this is before we even get to the war that in its present iteration. And, and the idea that there's zero credibility or zero credible evidence that Trump is behind some anti-Ukraine positioning, that's how I would interpret that, is just absolute nonsense. I mean, he's, he's, he's overtly friendly towards Putin. Uh, he's, he's prior to the war anti-Ukraine for whatever reason, possibly to do with, as mentioned, Zelensky. And that just continues throughout this war. Uh, we could go back in time. I actually don't have to go back too too far. We're going to go to July uh, 2023, 20, uh, so last year. Trump calls for conditioning aid 
are on congressional Biden probes, which I find particularly interesting. So even back last year, he was saying we should give aid to Ukraine, but only uh, uh, here he said here. This is what he said at a rally. Congress should refuse to authorize a single additional shipment of our depleted weapons stockpiles to Ukraine until the FBI, the DOJ and the IRS hand over every scrap of evidence they have on the Biden crime family's corrupt business dealings. Trump said at a rally. He added that any Republican lawmakers who didn't join the effort should face primary challenges. So that's his view, is that we should only give aid to Ukraine. Not There's no moral calculation here. There's no political calculation in terms of US foreign policy. This is how Trump can gain from aid. Aid only goes to Ukraine, which is what we saw with the, his Zelensky blackmailing. And it's the same last year. He hasn't changed his tune. We should only give aid if I get some kind of benefit, which is Ukraine, uh, the FBI, the DOJ and IRS hand every scrap of evidence they have on the Biden crime family's corrupt business dealings. And, and if any lawmaker goes against that, they should be primaried, which means that they shouldn't be put forward to run in the next election. They should be challenged by other Republicans who are going to be uh, much more they'll just be my lick spittles. Uh, so yeah, that, that is that is where he was in, in last year still. We have an Atlantic uh, um, article here from David Frum. And again, the idea is that, that there's zero credible evidence that Trump, etc., etc. Well, actually, I think these people are very credible. David uh, Frum here, who's you know, very famous in his writing and his, his opinions. At the beginning of Trump's ascendancy in the GOP, even his future allies in Congress distrusted his pro-Russian affinities. Kevin McCarthy, a future House Speaker, was inadvertently recorded in a June 2016 meeting with other Republican congressional leaders saying, Quote, there's two people I think Putin pays, Rohrabacher and Trump. Some in the room laughed. McCarthy responded, responded, swear to God. So just to let you know, Dana Rohrabacher was a Republican House member from California, a notorious Putin apologist and a joke figure among his caucus colleagues. Despite almost 30 years seniority in the House, he was kept away from major committee assignments because he was in the pocket of Putin, right? So he's saying there are two people in the pocket of Putin, someone that we already know is in the pocket of Putin, and Trump. And he said that in 2016. He said that in 2016. Anyway, uh, as David Frum later says, but once Trump became the GOP leader, he tangled the whole party in his pro-Russia ties. A telling indicator came in January 2017 when Trump's nominee for Attorney General Jeff Sessions denied under oath, yet falsely, that he had two meetings with the Russian ambassador, Sergei Kisilak, uh, during the 2016 campaign. This lie made little sense, as a senator on the Armed Services Committee, Sessions met with foreign ambassadors all the time, and he was never in the slightest implicated by any Trump-Russia impropriety, so why not tell the truth? The the answer seems to be that Sessions had somehow intuited that the Trump campaign was hiding some damaging secret about Russia. Without knowing what the secret was, he presumably wanted to put some distance between himself and it. Uh, the, alert, the urge to align with the party's new pro-Russian leader reshaped attitudes among pu Republican Party loyalists. From 2015 to 17, Republican opinion markedly shifted in a pro-Russia and pro-Putin direction. In 2017, more than a third of surveyed Republicans expressed favourable views to Putin of Putin. By 2019, Tucker Carlson, who had risen to the top place amongst Fox News hosts, was regularly promoting pro-Russian and anti-Ukrainian messages to his conservative audience. His success inspired imitators among many other conservative would-be stars uh so on and so forth so you know there's much more i could say in this article uh, but i'm just going to go to a bit later on here where it says so long as kevin mccarthy led the house republicans the relationship between their leadership and trump was one of fear and submission once johnson replaced mccarthy so mike johnson becoming the speaker the relationship between speaker and trump shifted to active collaboration mccarthy helped ukraine as much as he dared johnson helped ukraine as little as he can johnson still still talks about resisting Russia, but when it comes to time to act, he does as Trump wants. And that's still the case 
all this time later. A majority of the, Rush, uh, the House Republican caucus still rejects attempts to cut off Ukraine. A test vote on September the 28th last year counted 126 pro-Ukrainian Republicans versus 93 anti. Three quarters of the whole House favours Ukraine aid. But Johnson and his team now control the schedule and sequence of events. That group responds to the steady beat of the under news. Ukraine equals enemy of Trump. Abandoning Ukraine equals proof of loyalty to Trump. As Trump nears renomination by his party in 2024, the displays of loyalty to him have net, have become ever more obligatory for Republicans. Solidarity with Ukraine has faltered as support for Trump has consolidated. Make no mistake, if Republicans in Congress abandon Ukraine to Russian aggression, they do so to please Trump. Every other excuse is a fiction or a lie. And I go back to this idea that there's zero credible evidence of this kind of stuff taking place. And Applebaum, who knows far more than myself and, and the, uh, the, my interlocutor here, why is Trump trying to make Ukraine lose? The former president isn't in office, but is still dictating U.S foreign policy. And this is a great article that I've read much of it to you before. I'm just going to dip into it again. They see that Donald Trump Jr. routinely attacks legislators who vote aid to Ukraine. So that, that's hyperlinked. They've got evidence of him attacking people who, who vote for aid for Ukraine, suggesting that they be primaried, as mentioned before. The ex-president's son has also said the US should cut off money to Ukrainians because, quote, it's the only way to get them to the table. In other words, it's the only way to make Ukraine lose. And I've talked about that previously. And we're going to come on to Donald Trump Jr. in a second. Uh, yet Trump wants Congress to block it. Why? This is part that the part that nobody understands. Unlike his son, Trump himself rarely talks about Ukraine because his position isn't popular. Most Americans don't want Russia to win. Often Trump's motives are described as isolationist, but that's not quite right. The isolationists of the past were figures such as Senator Robert Taft, the son of an American president and the grandson of an American Secretary of War. Taft, a loyal member of the Republican Party, opposed U.S involvement in World War II because, as he once said, an overambitious foreign policy could destroy our armies and prove a real threat to the liberty of the people of the United States. But Trump is not concerned about our armies. He disdains our soldiers as suckers and losers. I can't imagine that he is terribly worried about the liberty of the people of the United States either, given that he's already tried once to overthrow the American electoral system and might well do it again. Trump and the people around him are clearly not isolationists in the old-fashioned sense. An isolationist wants to disengage from the world. Trump wants to remain engaged with the world, but on different terms. Trump has said repeatedly he wants to deal with Russian President Vladimir Putin, and maybe this is what he means. If Ukraine is partitioned, or if Ukraine loses the war, then Trump could twist the situation to his own advantage. Perhaps some speculate Trump wants to let Russia back into international oil markets and get something in return for that. But that explanation might be too complex. Maybe he just wants to damage President Joe Biden. Hmm. Or he thinks Putin will help him win the 2024 election. Hmm. The Russian hacking of the Democratic National Committee was very beneficial to Trump in 2016. Perhaps it could happen again. So on and so forth. So lots of like theorizing as to why, what is behind Trump's rationale here. Uh, here is an article back in February. There's another interesting Financial Times article on Trump again today to do with Ukraine. But this one in, in February by uh, Gideon uh, Rachman says the Republicans' refusal to supply arms is sabotaging Kiev's war effort. Trump's betrayal of Ukraine. Zero credible evidence. I don't know that that's the case. At Trump's behest, Republicans in Congress are blocking military aid to Ukraine, says uh, Ruckman here. Um, Putin has made a long-term bet on Trump. Unless there is a last-minute change of heart in Congress, the wager may finally put out, pay out on the battlefields of Ukraine. And this is talking about how uh, the Republican Party has increasingly become under the sway of, of, of Trump and uh, he's really betraying Ukraine. I mean, here we've got a Sky News article, how Trump blocked USA for Ukraine to help his in his bid to beat Biden. It's a tale that cuts to the heart of America's political chaos, but the Senate passing a funding bill for Ukraine is not a straightforward one. Uh, and yeah, lots that, that we could go to in this article, but I'll just go down to here. Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill rejected the Democrat domestic border proposals, the very proposals they have been calling for. Why? Because Trump urged them to reject them. He even threatened the Republicans who voted for the border package would find their careers at an end. Now, if you remember, uh, Mike Johnson, the speaker, was in constant uh, 
uh, and this is what Johnson himself claimed, constant communication with Trump about this. So this is very much at the bidding of Trump. Trump and his allies recognize that a chaotic southern border helps him. If Biden sorted out the border, then he'd get the credit. It's no longer a tool for Trump uh, as he seeks to beat Biden in November's election. And so with the overwhelming power he holds over conservative lawmakers in the lower house of Congress, he managed to block the southern border bill. The whole package fell apart. Ukraine's ability to defend itself and the security of America's southern border were both in jeopardy and the victims of raw politics. Uh, and then we got back to like separating the border bill from uh, Ukraine aid. Um, and uh, here we have the Wall Street Journal, which is very much in, you know, this is a, um, a Murdoch paper that's very much in the pocket of the Republicans. Being pretty brutal here, how Trump turned conservatives against helping Ukraine. So this idea, zero evidence, uh, zero credible evidence that Trump is orchestrating some sort of anti-Ukraine conspiracy with the Speaker or other House members, and we've got zero credible evidence. Well, here is a essentially a Republican newspaper saying how Trump turned conservatives against helping Ukraine. I mean, that's basically what this this article is showing. It, very much not zero credible evidence. Anyway, there's some interesting views from people at CPAC here. Um, in uh, This is going back in f to February. Quote, I don't want any more funding for Ukraine. That's important to me, said Sue Herrera, a 70-year-old retired jeweler from Seneca, uh, Pennsylvania. Quote, we need to take care of ourselves first. I don't agree with Putin. He's definitely a dictator, but I don't think he's causing all the problems. Okay, so we're starting to get towards a sort of pro-Russian propaganda, but actually, no, Putin's still a bad guy, but, you know, he's not fully to blame. Mary Weyermuller, a 63-year-old Chicagoan retired from the real estate business, offered a similar assessment. Quote, I don't want to fund the war in Ukraine. The whole thing seems shady, he said, adding a charge unsupported by evidence. Quote, we don't even know who the good guys and bad guys are, and we know Joe Biden's getting paid off by Ukraine. No, we don't. We we don't. We precisely don't know that. In fact, we do know who the good guys and bad guys are by all the war crimes that are being committed, by what Russia is doing to Kharkiv, to Kherson, to all of these cities around Ukraine. We very clearly know that. It was a message that was echoed by the speeches of the conference stage, quote, decide, Joe Biden, which country matters more to you, the border of the United? This is what's called a false dichotomy. You're trying to present only one or the other, but it can be both. It can be you know, both of these things are important, actually. Uh, is it the, the border of the United States or the border of Ukraine? Said uh, represented by Ron Donalds, a Florida Republican, who former President Donald Trump recently said he was considering as a running mate. Quote, I haven't voted for m any money to go to Ukraine because I know they can't win, said Senator Tommy Tuberville, a Republican from Alabama, one of 26 Republicans to vote against the aid package that passed the Senate on February the 13th. And after an all night floor debate, quote, Donald Trump, will stop it when he first gets in. He knows there's no winning for Ukraine. He can work a deal with Putin. I just want to remind you about uh, Tommy Tuber Tuberville, actually, um, who says... Tommy Tuberville competes for Congress's biggest Putin sycophant. Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville has hit an absolute low with his pro-Putin rant. He said, you can't tell, you sorry, you can't, you can tell Putin's on top of his game. Hey, he's on top of his game, Putin. One thing he said that it really rung a bell is the propaganda media machine over here, as in, in the US, they sell anything they possibly can to go after Russia, Tuberville said, aping almost word for word the Kremlin's talking points on American opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We forced this issue. In other words, you, the US is responsible for the war in Ukraine said Tuberville. We kept forcing NATO all the way to Eastern Europe and Putin just got tired of it. He said, listen, I do not want missiles on my border from the United States. It'd be like Russia coming to Mexico and putting missiles in Mexico. I can understand what he's talking about, Tuberville added, showing an empathy apparently reserved only for authoritarians. Uh, just out, absolutely outrageous. Um, they can't win, Tuberville told uh, Paul, referring to Ukraine. Half the country's like we are. They don't even know what war is going on, he added. Uh, whatever. Uh, so that's who he is. Um, 
And uh, yes, yeah, so just to carry on, there's this group of Republicans for Ukraine. It's much more moderate, sensible Republicans who say, look, we're, we're a Republican, but we want to support Ukraine. They say, quote, Trump's always been in love with Putin, but now a big chunk of the Republican Party is as well, Longwell lamented in an interview. If you grew up with the Cold War as a backdrop to watch what's happening to the Republican Party right now, it's absolutely staggering. Ronald Reagan would be spinning in his grave. Uh, in recent weeks, Trump ha has declined to condemn Russian pres President Vladimir Vladimir Putin for the February 16th death of Alexei Navalny, instead comparing his own multifarious legal issues to the plight of the imprisoned opposition leader. He has said he wouldn't defend NATO countries that don't meet their financial commitments to the alliance, but would instead encourage Russia to do whatever the hell they want. In a CNN town hall in May, he refused to say which side he hoped would win the war. And that was after repeated asking from Caitlin Collins as well. Trump's remaining primary opponent, former United Nations ambassador Nikki Haley, obviously she dropped out now, this is written some time ago, has harshly criticised his stance. Quote, Trump is siding with a dictator who kills his political opponents, she said in a recent campaign appearance in South Carolina. Trump sided with an evil man over our allies who stood with us on 9-11. Think about what that told them. Uh, and then later, the article says Trump's relationship with Russia and its autocratic leader has long been controversial. During the 2016 campaign, he implored Russia to hack and release Hillary Clinton's emails and US intelligence agencies later concluded he benefited from Russian and election interference. The early years of Trump's administration were shadowed by the Robert Mueller's investigation into Trump's links to Russia, which he called a witch hunt and a hoax. In Helsinki in 2018, which we've already seen, he stood beside Putin and declared that he trusted the Russian leader's word over that of the American intelligence community. In 2019, he was impeached for the first time for allegedly threatening to withdraw, withhold sorry, military assistance from Ukraine unless it provided evidence of what he insisted were Biden's corrupt activities there. House Republicans have continued to pursue those corruption allegations in an impeachment inquiry that suffered a severe blow when key witnesses was accused of fabricating his claims on behalf of Russian intelligence. So Smirnov has come out as, as then been arrested for basically lying to the FBI and then said, oh, by the way, more my information came from Russian intelligence, which is a whole... Joe Biden basis, really, of the Joe Biden impeachment inquiry. Um, and and th that is not a good look for, by extension, for, for Trump. Anyway, later here, Putin, uh, uh, this is um, Tom Tillis calling Carlson a useful idiot. I think this is Tillis. Oh, no, this is uh, Kristen Bocanegra of Ashburn, Virginia, a 35-year-old staffer for, and a, for a long-shot GOP Senate candidate, said Putin in the Tucker interview, so Tucker Carlson went to Moscow to interview Putin, is really eye-opening. We got to hear his side, his motive. He's like a teacher. We're told by the media that Russia is really bad, but young people today are doing our own research, not just believing what we're being told. I know Trump had good relations with him. This administration, it's like, what happened? Many attendees argue that Putin was provoked by NATO's push to add Ukraine to the alliance. Quote, Mitch McConnell is not a real Republican. Oh, the old no true Scotsman fallacy, hey? Uh, he needs to go. He's too old. He's compromised. He does not represent the ideolo ideology of most Republicans, said Pat O'Brien of Fairfax, Virginia, a 67-year-old retiree. Quote, the war is the fault of the US. We have no business encouraging Ukraine to join NATO. That's what triggered this whole thing. Putin has come out and told you why he's doing this. And it's not to do with Ukraine. This is a really good point the other day from, uh, I forget who it was I was watching, um, but I showed a bit of it to you. And it was it's this really good point that Putin tells you why he's at war and propagandists tell you why they're at war with Russia. And it's all to do with U Russia, sorry, with Ukraine. Russia has no bat, no, no, boundaries there are no borders right and they're just one with us they are at ours this is historically our place that's what they're doing it's not to do with nato anymore it's almost like they've forgotten that whole nato thing what's really at the heart of this is this rose-tinted view of soviet empire uh, the conference slogan this year is where globalism goes to die. So that's CPAC for you. And that's their kind of positioning. Um, and then, of course, we had a Hungarian leader praising uh, Republican frontrunner, so Donald Trump, as a man of peace, saying that it came out and did the spokesperson thing for Putin, uh, for, uh, well, yeah, for Putin, for Trump, by saying that not a penny will go to Ukraine if Trump gets in. He will not give a pen penny to the Ukraine-Russia war. Hung Orban Tan told Hungarian state media on Saturday. Therefore, the war will end because it's obvious that Ukraine cannot stand on its own two feet. And if you don't believe that, 
Go and look at what Donald Trump's son has been saying consistently. So Trump Jr. has mocked Ukraine aid during an event in Charleston. Tr Trump Jr. mocked claims that Ukraine aid was a top issue for members of his party. He conducted an informal survey among approximately 50 voters, and none of them identified Ukraine as one of their top 10 policy priorities. And he keeps slagging off Ukraine for being overtly corrupt, etc., etc. It doesn't say anything about Russia, though, which is even more corrupt. Uh, ending the conflict, about that, he said in an appearance on a Tim Cast IRL podcast, ooh, is that Tim Pool? Uh, Trump Jr. suggested that the only way to end the Ukraine conflict is to cut off the money. It's just what you heard from Viktor Orban, is to cut off the money. He implied that withholding financial support would force Ukraine to come to the negotiating table. If you don't realise that Donald Trump Jr. is is sitting at times with his father discussing Ukraine, like it's no coincidence that Viktor Orban is, is saying exactly what Donald Trump Jr. has been saying. It's no coincidence that that is taking place. And if you think that somehow Donald Trump doesn't believe these things, even though his son does, and even though his aides do, and even though his supporters do, and even though lawmakers that support him do, and even though D Victor Orban does, if you think Donald Trump doesn't think these things, then you, uh, you're just sadly mistaken. Claiming Ukraine's loss in an online attack against US government foreign policy, Donald Trump Jr. asserted that Ukraine had already lost the war against Russia. He spends his entire time on Twitter slagging off Ukraine. I actually had it up earlier, but I... I, I Oh no, I have some of it here. Actually, no, this is this is where it was. If you just do a, a search for Ukraine and Donald Trump Jr. on his Twitter account... He, like, wow, a really honest and powerful pitch from Zelensky on why America should send Ukraine more aid. And someone's overdubbed uh, the or the subtitled Zelensky speaking, saying that he just wants crack cocaine and this and that. And it's just a massive, like, hatchet job on Zelensky. And, uh, yeah, laughy emojis, because that's really responsible, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, how do we end the Russia-Ukraine war? Cut off the money. Curious about the billions of dollars and weapons of Congress have sent Ukraine? You need to watch the first episode of the explosive 12-part series, Zelensky Unmasked, and exposes the truth behind the war in Ukraine. In other words, it's overt Russian propaganda. I don't think actual Republican voters agree with DC rhinos, Republicans in name only, who claim that sending unlimited billions of dollars to Ukraine should be the top of priority for Republicans, and so on and so forth. It just It's just one attack on Ukraine after another. And that is that is Donald Trump Jr., there is nothing else in his repertoire of Ukraine um, opinions other than insults to Ukraine and siding effectively with uh, Russia. And it's just deeply, deeply uh, depressing. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's really clear to me where what 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 Trump thinks is uh, I'm going to just leave you with this. We're going to dip into this quite a bit. Um, this is a, a, a fascinating uh, few segments here involving Gary Kasparov, the former chess master, who's now a massive Russian uh, critic, a critic of Russia, and he's Russian. Uh, this is what he has to say. To this war with Ukraine, I think Putin's on top of his game. The words of Senator Tommy Tuberville and everything we've heard from Marjorie Taylor Greene. When you hear United States officials saying those things, what does it sound like to your ear? I can't believe my ears. I grew up in a world where America was a formidable force. Love or hate, it was there. And what's happening now is just, it's for me and my European friends, is like the world is falling apart. And, uh, and calling it disinformation is probably too generous. Outright lies. They don't even pretend to, to uh, make it sound as, 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 as real. So they're simply turning it, the world ups, upside down. And, uh, and of course, you know, they, they want Ukraine to lose. They're not hiding it. Unfortunately, administration is also not showing enough strengths. So this is the problem for Europeans, the way they see it is you have feckless administration and then reckless Trump mm. uh, and, and, and a treacherous, treacherous uh, Republicans that are that rooting for Putin to win and all along hiding it. I mean, I don't know, not recognizing that Ukraine is not the last stop. You know, it's not Gary Kasparov saying, it's Putin is saying that. Putin's propaganda is saying that they're going to change the world. 
They are not attacking Ukraine. By the way, that at war. By, by, the way, by the way, let's be very clear. He said after after Ukraine, it will be Latvia, it'll be Lithuania, it will, uh, he's going to Poland. He's talked it's about not Poland. Anything. He doesn't have he's, to say. He, he's he's taking no, 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 he's, he's not, more. He, they are at war with NATO. If you have to listen to Russian propaganda, they are not fighting Ukraine. Ukraine right. is American and, and NATO puppet. So that's right. why for them, winning war in Ukraine is showing that the West is a paper is is it is is a paper tiger. And of course, you know, next will be, you know, just it's, uh, uh, one of the NATO countries. And oh, oh, the whole idea is to take revenge for the World War III. They, they, they thought the, the, the Cold War was World War III. They lost. Right. And they are now in World War IV. While we're saying, oh, let's avoid World War III, Putin is already in World War IV now. Again, it's, it's he saying that, he yeah. keeps repeating it. And unfortunately, the way it's this thing's being conducted, he believes he's winning. And Jonathan mm -hmm. Lemire, the message that's sent to China, to President Xi, to Kim Jong-un in North Korea, unmistakable message, unmistakable. And this is what Republican chairmen and chairwomen in the House have said about their idiot backbenchers who are, are pro-Putin, saying, you're, you're not just giving Putin Ukraine and Eastern and Central Europe, you're giving Xi Taiwan. You, you know who else said this yesterday was Prime Minister Kishida of Japan, standing next to President Biden in the Rose Garden at a news conference saying what happens in Ukraine could be a, 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 a coming attraction as to what happens in the Taiwan Strait. And, and that's why Japan has been so involved in that effort as well. There's deep concern here that if, there, if the Republicans in the Congress, if they stand down, America can't help this ally, they won't help the next one either. And Ed Luce, uh, President Biden in that news conference, he concluded it, in fact, by saying you, this Ukraine bill needs to come for a vote. This vote will pass. Put it on the floor. That's up to Speaker Johnson. Where's Speaker Johnson going tomorrow? He's going to Mar-a-Lago, and he's going to meet with Donald Trump. So, what are your expectations when we come out of this meeting? Just that there's been a little momentum, a little optimism in the recent days that some sort of Ukraine bill may go forward. This could easily be scuttled. It could very easily be. Um, the Foreign Secretary and former Prime Minister of Britain, David Cameron, went down to Mar-a-Lago to try to persuade Trump. Uh, as I sort of think of it, he, he bought fruits to the volcano. Didn't have any luck um, by the reports I've heard. I don't think Mike Johnson is going down there to talk um, about Ukraine um, because he knows what answer he would get. He's going to give a joint conference on with Trump on election integrity, which I find very hard to say uh, with a straight face. I think Johnson's now had six months um, to show where he stands on the Ukraine issue. And, and all along, his, his instinct has been to faint. To, uh, this is a really good synopsis of Johnson. Pretend that he's trying to get a bill to Pretend. the floor, but actually, in practice, stop um, a bill from getting to the floor because he knows that he cannot supply Ukraine and please Trump. You cannot do both. That's a circle he cannot square. And if it comes to a choice, every time Mike Johnson will go for Trump. Uh, just one last point. People refer to the, the Republican stance, the MAGA Republican stance, as isolationism. It's not. This is active pro-Russia interventionism. So this Ouch. is an important point that Ed Luce just made up, just, just stated. Angus King... In his, in his, in, in his, in, uh, when he dealt with uh, the, the, the Secretary of Defense, invoked 1940, America First. What do you think is the motivation behind the Americans who are supporting Putin in this instance? Which is a really good question. So we know what the issue is with Ukraine. We got that. But what do you think is actually behind this that leads folk to, to embrace uh, Russia in the way they are embracing it? It's a long story, and uh, I think the parallels with 1940 probably may not be uh, 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 very accurate because the balance of power in 1940 was not as this, uh, 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 as is today. Okay. Don't forget, you know, the Germany was too strong. Stalin was on German uh, on German side. Japan was too strong. Italy was also controlled by fascists. Today, the free world has overwhelming military and economic advantage. And I think it's just, it's, again, we're getting lazy. We're complacent yep. on one side. But also, you have Donald Trump, and it's, the, it's, it's a very different view about America's role. Donald Trump is not hiding his agenda. He wants to make, not peace, but deals with Putin's yeah. of this world. And, and I, I, I can hardly explain how people in his party, some of them, but still minority, are openly arguing for Putin's interests. Because, you know, you have to, you have to go just, it's all, all, all the way down the road. If Ukraine loses, 
then American lives will be at, will be on the line because then it, or you have to walk away. But don't forget, the America America can fund the deficit because dollar is a reserve currency. This is such an important point. Uh, uh, about why it's in America's best, best interest to support Ukraine and not to go isolationist, because that global hegemony is is something and and, and well, is something that Americans w- would want to maintain. And I know there are many people saying you're never going to re- replace the American dollar as the international currency, but you know you could start chipping away at that quite quite successfully. And this is what he talks about. But don't forget, the America America can fund the deficit because dollar is a reserve currency. Why dollar is reserve currency? Because America is strong. If you sacrifice America's strength and walk away, a lot of people, I mean, China is there waiting, you know, this, they say, why should, we, why should we pay American debt? So America has no choice but to stay on top or the, it's, everything will fall down as house of cards. Talk about last night's attacks in Ukraine. Uh, it's- um, um, and we'll leave it there. Um, just... I think I think that was very interesting from Gary Kasparov or Kasparov. But I go I go back to this idea that I think it's very clear to me what side Trump is on. Well, actually, Trump's on his own side. Trump is about self-aggrandizement. Is about doing deals that only benefit him. He's so incredibly transactional uh, that and narcissistic. He he lacks empathy. Uh, you can see that in everything he's ever said. When Alexei Navalny died, the whole the whole tweet or the whole true social post was about him. He just twisted it straight away. He didn't say anything about oh, the family or or you know how I so upset for the future of democracy and for the people of Russia not having a voice or anything like that. It was like. Alexei Navalny's died and oh look look how terrible America is for trying to do the same to me as 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 to Navalny and all that kind of stuff and you're like so he completely lacks empathy and any any interaction internationally is all about making him get to a better place be in a better position um and and he just loves strong men as well and so he he kind of wants to be a strong man himself he's talked about how you know that hot mic incident the other day about how you know king john un when he says things people sit up straight and why can't they do that for for me type thing you know he absolutely loves strong men and dictators he wants to be one and he wants to shut down he's talked about in his rallies about regulating media before and always getting people to boo the free press behind you like have a go at them he's you talk about first amendment freedom of speech but he he's one of the first ones to uh, rail against the press and whatnot so i don't know i i do know it, i think it's absolutely an untenable position uh, to believe that that Donald Trump is anything but um, not looking out for Ukraine at all. He, he, he so he is he is looking out for himself and strong men, and there is no real moral because possibly because of that lack of empathy. But there's no real moral evaluation of, about what's going on. Like he doesn't look at imagery like that, like you and I do, of like destroyed Ukrainian buildings and go, that's freaking terrible like i'm so angry today me i have like human emotions real human empathetic emotions where i look at stuff and it makes me just incandescent with rage and tears fill my eyes because that upsets me and angers me because that you know for the (laughs) for the grace of the cosmos that could be me and my children dying in that but no he doesn't look at stuff like he doesn't think about things like that he might pay lip service occasionally to to like the deaths of humans but but there's no kind of visceral anger there's just like well how can i make myself better out of this situation what's in it for me when it's you, Ukraine javelins, you want javelins. Oh, I, I don't care that, that Russia's invaded you and screwing you over. What if you got some dirt on Biden? Because I want to win an election. Come on then, mate. Might give you some javelins afterwards, but you've got to do me some favours first. It's so transactional. And that is where he's at. And so I have absolutely no doubt that if he became president in 2024, that you, Ukraine would be screwed. And I'll sit at that table and put that that banner around the table and say, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong 
that this is not the case. I could be wrong, but if you are, if you've got this far, and you're still watching this, and you're a fan of Trump or uh, or a Republican, like you're going to be feeling maybe like attacked by this in some way. But I want you to deal with the substance and deal with the things he said. And I haven't even dipped into like a, a hundredth of what Trump has said about Ukraine. I haven't gone to those interviews he's given about ceding territory to Russia, about forcing them to the negotiation tables, about all of that kind of stuff. And that just feeds into exactly what I've been saying. So there's plenty more evidence I could bring. Uh, there's only so much time in a day and you guys don't want me banging on any longer than I have done already. Already, So time to go. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Take care and please let me know respectfully in the comments what you think.